Good afternoon, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. My name is Elias Grampas, and on behalf of the Secretariat of the European Parliament Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development, I am delighted to welcome you to today's event, where we will be addressing supporting EU biodiversity targets by bridging the science policy divide. Um, just to begin then, uh, we all know that a healthy and biodiverse environment is an essential component uh, with regards to many aspects of life of Earth, uh, so we have a common mission there. Uh, what is also of paramount importance is building on the science policy nexus, as I'm sure we will be hearing more of in the course of this event. On this note, I'm happy to let you know uh, that this event of the intergroup is co-organized with colleagues from EGU, the European Geoscience Union, that I would like to thank very much for their active engagement in all steps of the event organization. Uh, this event is, of course, hosted uh, by MEPs Mr. Luena and Ms. Paulus, uh, European Parliament Rapporteur and Shadow Rapporteur for the Nature Restoration Law. And then, right on time before uh, kick-starting the, the discussion, I'd like to provide our audience some housekeeping rules with regards to the event. So, first of all, the event is recorded, and the recording will be made available as of tomorrow at the website of the European Parliament Intergroup. There is also, I think, uh, one uh, PPT that also will be made available uh, on the website of the intergroup following the green light of the speakers. And then, as we want to have a discussion that is as interactive as possible, I would like to let our audience know, uh, the one that is connected online, that you can send us your questions uh, through the right-hand side of the platform. There is a Q&A box specifically for that. So within, uh, within your choice, just make sure to know that you use the all panelists option so we can see the questions popping up. And of course, for the audience in the room, uh, when we reach the Q&A session, please feel free to raise your hands and we'll take uh, as many questions as uh, time will allow us. So once again, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, the event's opening remarks were to be provided by MEP Ms. Paulus, but as we're uh, just uh, trying to resolve this issue, I would like to give a fresh uh, plot twist by providing the floor to Ms. Helen Glaves, uh, President uh, uh, for her uh, opening remarks as well. Uh, Ms. Glaves is Senior Data Scientist at this uh, Geological Survey with a background in both marine geoscience and geoinformatics, elected to serve as its EU President in the 2019 EGU Autumn elections. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ilias, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to take this opportunity to add my welcome to, to Ilias's uh, at the start of this event, um, both for everybody who's here in the room, but also everybody who's taken the time to join us online. Um, on behalf of EGU, I'd also like to thank our host, um, MEPs, Cesar Luena and Jutapoulos. Um, but I also want to thank our honoured guests on the panel for taking the time out from their busy schedules to join us today. I think this event is actually extremely timely and relevant as we observe the critical deliberations that are going on this week in Egypt uh, at COP27. Um, biodiversity is a critical priority for Europe which has been highlighted with the launch of the EU's biodiversity strategy for 2030, and also the European restoration law, which are both seeking to address the increasing decline in the natural environment due to human activities. The strategies and actions to mitigate these impacts on our natural world require a sustained collaboration between scientists and those decision makers who are developing the informed actions and policies to address the challenges that are facing both society and our planet. I'd like to start my intervention here um, with just a few words about the European Geosciences Union. Um, as Ilias mentioned, I'm the current president of EGU. Um, EGU is the, the largest earth, space and planetary science organization in Europe. Um, we have between 18,000 and 19,000 members who come from a variety of scientific di disciplines, representing an extensive breadth of knowledge and expertise across the geosciences and beyond EGU's goals. EGU aims to foster fundamental and applied research in the earth, space and planetary sciences that addresses both key societal and environmental issues. 
EGU also supports a range of activities, include, including those related to science for policy through its dedicated working group. And it's to them that I offer my thanks for their um, efforts to organize this event this week. The, um, the policy, Science for Policy Working Group within EGU aims to connect, connect geoscience experts with policymakers to support informed decision making. As part of these initiatives, in 2022, EGU created EGU Task Force on Biodiversity that includes selected experts from relevant disciplines, including soil sciences, biogeosciences, hydrology, and others. This group has come together to provide relevant and impartial information from scientific ex experts for those who are at the forefront of policymaking that will affect the future of society and the planet that we all share. Recently, the EGU Task Force in Biodiversity reviewed the forthcoming EU restoration law and actually um, drafted a set of informed recommendations that, that have drawn on the the latest scientific research and expert opinion. Um, and there is a report available, which there are a number of uh, copies, I believe, available around the room. So if you haven't already had one of these, please do take the time to pick one up. Um, if, if we don't have enough, um, it is available to download online as well. Today's discussion will actually focus on how scientists and policymakers can come together to support the EU's targets for biodiversity, but also consider how they can collaborate more effectively for the future. And with this in mind, um, we will start by having a panel discussion um, with the, the, the guests here on the stage. Um, so um, I'm actually going to hand the floor back to Ilias, I think, to kick off the, the questioning for our panel. We're going to begin with a question for all of the panel. So Ilias, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, and thanks uh, as well for uh, setting the scene with regards to the importance, but also the timely nature of having this uh, discussion today. As we mentioned here before, it looks like the video message of uh, co-hosting MEP Ms. Paulus will be played uh, later in the course of this event, so we can move to the, to the panel discussion. Starting by thanking our uh, excellent set of speakers, uh, either being uh, physically in the room uh, or connected online, so thank you very much uh, on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup uh, for that. And um, in fact, Helen, I don't know if you want to introduce the speakers. Yeah, or, I yeah? can do that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much. So uh, our panel of speakers here today, um, uh, another tw plot twist, as you described it, Elias, a moment ago. Um, to my immediate right, um, we actually have Irene Benito Rodriguez. Um, Irene is actually replacing our original planned speaker from, from Planet. So I have to apologize to Irene because I don't actually have a bio for, for Irene, but I'm sure we will learn about your background uh, during your interventions. To my immediate right is uh, Gregor Dubois. Gregor is uh, at the EU Knowledge Centre for Biodiversity, which enhances biodiversity knowledge base and facilitates its dis dissemination by fostering cross-sectoral policy dialogue and the challenges we face when integrating science into policy process. To my left, I have here um, Felicia Akinyema. Uh, Felicia is uh, actually uh, a Marie Curie Research Fellow uh, on Land System and Sustainable Land Management U Unit at the Institute of Geography at the University of Bern, Switzerland. Um, but uh, Felicia is also actually a member of the EGU's Biodiversity Task Force. So she has a double role here with us today. Um, You've also met Ilias, who is uh, here on the panel. And beyond Ilias, we have Anne Deval. Anne is uh, a biodiversity mainstreaming specialist um, for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, also on the panel today, um, we have uh, uh, Yannicka Borg, 
apologies. We have Yannicka Borg, who is an expert uh, in biodiversity strategy from the European Environment Agency. Uh, we also have um, Alberto Arroyo Schnell. Uh, I believe Alberto is online with us. Um, uh, he is the head of policy and program for the European Regional Office of the IUCN. Uh, so that is our uh, panel for today. Um, and with that, I will hand across to Ilias to start the panel discussion with the first question. Thank you very much, Helen, and welcome once again to all uh, panelists. Well, just to set the scene, uh, one first question that I think is uh, worth addressing is, uh, if you were to tweet about this event today on uh, biodiversity and nature restoration, what would be your hashtag for this discussion? Uh, that This is to serve as the main message uh, there, a keyword perhaps that you would be focusing on. So perhaps we can follow this sequence of the panel and then uh, uh, looking into the speakers that are connected online as well. So maybe in just yep. the phrase. Yeah, perfect. And um, thank you for having me here and apologize again for my colleague Agnieszka, who is trapped uh, without internet in COP27. Not trapped, but you know, in the specific location without internet connection. And my name is Irene Benito, as Helen uh, kindly introduced. I'm working in Planet in European Affairs and I'm delighted to be here today. So I'll move quickly to my hashtag, which is you cannot manage what you don't measure. And I think this is super important when we're thinking about the binding targets that the EU nature restoration law is going to, to place um, upon us in Europe. So my hashtag would be steer for change. We hear a lot of driving for change, but I think what we need is really steering for change. We need to have a clearer direction on how we want to go and where we want to go together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here also. So my hashtag will be science for EU nature restoration. So this would be the main idea that we can promote the use of um, science-based evidence to be able to address policy relevance to biodiversity in the EU. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, the hashtag from FAO would be no food without biodiversity. Emphasize really the, the connection and the interdependence between biodiversity conservation and sustainable biodiversity in our food systems. Thank you very much. And how about uh, IUCN and uh, Alberto's views on this? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, I'm not going to enter into the Twitter discussion about the new ownership, of course, just focusing on the handle of the or the headline, which is the main issue about Twitter. Uh, I'm going to focus actually on the collaboration side of the things. We all know that we are developing now a new piece of legislation that will have the same challenges as the pieces of legislation that are there now from the European side. And one of them is the implementation. That is always an issue. One of the fundamental issues related with implementation is about the ownership of the different stakeholders. And there comes the collaboration that I wanted to mention. The EU nature restoration law is a historic opportunity for us and for our environment. This will be the tweet. To make it work, collaboration amongst all stakeholders will be key. Scientists, land users, businesses, NGOs, youth advocates. We need to ensure that we all feel that this is our law from the start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. And then uh, how about you, Yannicka? What would be your hashtag uh, for this discussion today on behalf of EA? Yes, hello and thank you for the invitation and very, very glad to be here. Uh, Alberto spoke about collaboration, which is very important and my thoughts were along the same lines. Um, this nature restoration is something we have to see as an overcompassing attempt to make sure that we have a, a continued future on, on this planet that we all share and because this requires the collaboration that Alberto mentioned. I want to take this a step further and say that my hashtag would be restore biodiversity to benefit everyone. So this includes also all the sectors who are building their, their livelihoods on biodiversity. Well, thank you very much, Yannicka, and thanks a lot to all the speakers. I think 
we have already some uh, uh, quotes for social media. We cannot manage what we cannot measure. We need to steer for change. We need to make the best use of the available science for EU nature restoration. We need to restore biodiversity to benefit everyone. No food without biodiversity. And of course, it's extremely important to focus on implementation and collaboration between all stakeholders. So I think it's very important that also on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup, this is our approach that is deeply rooted in the core of the mission of the Intergroup since 1994, uh, following a multi-stakeholder approach uh, involving all the relevant uh, actors on board. So maybe on this note, I give the floor back to Helen uh, to drive the discussion forward. Thank you very much, Elias, and, and thank you for the initial interventions from our panelists. Um, I, I, I think that's really set the scene for the rest of the panel discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start off with a few directed questions for our panelists. Um, and I'm actually um, going to first come to, to Gregor Dubois first. Um, Gregor, the, the EU Knowledge Centre for Biodiversity enhances biodiversity, the biodiversity knowledge base, and it's facilitating dissemination by fostering cross-sectional policy dialogue. And I wonder if you can say something about the challenges that we face um, when seeking to integrate science into the policy making. Um, what are your views about how the scientific community and the policy community together can actually overcome some of these challenges? Thank you for that. Uh, it was making my travel worse coming. Uh, I, I really love the topic, of course. Uh, we, the Knowledge Center for Biodiversity wants to solve a big hurdle. We, we, we don't want to go back to obscurantism. We want to have science-based policies. But how can we make sure that the science really flows into the policies? And it's mainly, the obstacle is mainly a, a communication issue. And there are three dimensions uh, in this problem. Why do we have uh, such a problem? The first one is uh, the temporal dimension. Uh, we have a lot of interactions with the scientific community, but on a sporadic uh, way. What we need is much more continuity. The policy is a process from the design to the development, implementation, to the monitoring, uh, to the assessment of the impact of the policy. Usually we have researchers coming in and out but what we need is a continuity in the dialogue. So that's the first thing that needs to be kept in mind is continuity in the dialogue. The second one is a spatial dimension, especially for biodiversity, this is vital. We want to make sure that the right hand is not going to undo what the left is doing. We, we speak about constantly about competition for lands. At the time we are speaking, we have so many sectors talking about the same piece of land that will be used either for energy, either for nature conservation, either for food, either for living, either for constructions. You can imagine so many uses of the same piece of land. And the same happens to the marine environment, but to another, uh, to another extent. But the challenge is there, and we need to make sure that we can have all the sectors uh, sitting together around the same table. And that's one of the challenges that we have, of course, we try to solve through the Knowledge Centre for Biodiversity, which is quite new, actually. It's only two years old. And then the third challenge is a structural challenge. It's really how do we manage this wealth of information that is floating around, that is constantly published, the data that are available, how do we access that in a synthetic way to help the policymakers take the right decision? So we don't have the solutions to all of these problems, but at least we're working on it to provide a one-stop shop to provide the interface to the scientific community and uh, to the policymakers. And I need to stress that the communication issue is really a bidirectional challenge. It's not only the scientific community that is slowly improving its way of communicating to the policymakers, but also for the policymakers to formulate properly the questions that can be used by the scientific community to really move on. So these are the three uh, dimensions that uh, are, I think, the main hurdles and the main uh, challenges that we try to, to address with the Noise Center for Biodiversity. Thank you ever so much, Gregor, for that intervention. Um, I think you, you mentioned some topics that are very relevant for um, the discussions that we're having internally at EGU with regards to that flow of information from our members as researchers to policymakers. Um, so I, I, I 
I very much appreciate that intervention because I think it's it's a, a challenge that EGU already recognises, and this is part of the reason that we have now um, set up mechanisms within our organisation to try and facilitate that flow of information. So, so thank you. I think I think that's that set the scene very well for the discussion. Thank you. Um, so I'd now like to to come to Alberto Arroyo Schnell. Um, who is Head of Policy and Programme at, at the European Regional Office of the IUCA. Um, and Alberto is online. Um, so, Alberto, um, in a recent press release, IUCN highlighted the EU's nature restoration law as an important boost for biodiversity and climate. So my question to you is, um, why do you feel that immediate action on this topic is important at this point in time. Why, where do you think that more effort is needed in this topic and what role can scientists play in supporting the biodiversity targets on an EU level and at implementation at the member state level as well? Because both facets of this discussion are equally important. Yes, thank you very much for the question. You know, I have been working on this matter on environmental issues on biodiversity and EU policy in particular biodiversity for more than 20 years now. So when I hear the question why urgent action is needed, it's a question that every day is easier and easier to answer, I have to say. We all know about uh, very specific examples such as rivers that existed when, when I was a child and I could swim there and there, now they don't exist and there were crabs there that are not there anymore. We all know about climate change consequences such as forest fires in North Europe. We can already see all these consequences. During all these years, and this is the important bit, the answer that we have provided, we have tried to make the case for nature. For its own sake, after we were trying to use more convincing matters, such as economy, such as our own health, at this point, what we know is that conservation and restoration of nature is fundamental for our own survival. We can mention some specific issues such as agriculture, which is one of the main threats for biodiversity, but at the same time is the one that is providing the food, obviously, our food, we need it. And at the same time, the degradation of biodiversity is affecting very much. So there is no way to deal with it if we are not working with this sector very much specifically. And at the very end, what is saying is that conservation is a very anthropogenic issue. It's not exactly for nature, it's for all of us. So if urgent action was needed 20 years ago, now it's probably double or triple than it was at the time. Now, in terms of working with scientists, as you were asking also, well, IUCN is a science-based organization, as you know, so our work is underpinned, is, is guided, actually, by the latest scientific evidence. We have many tools that I'm sure you are familiar with, such as the Red List, the Nature-Based Solution Standard, the Global Ecosystems Typology. Well, it is hard to say how scientists could work with IUCN, as it will be saying how IUCN can work with itself. Now, giving voice to scientists is the fundamental bit in discussions such as the one we are having now, policy processes. Even such as this one, consultations, trying to ensure that the voice of science is heard is fundamental. I want to also emphasize here the responsibility from science itself to get familiar with the policy processes, being aware of the weight of their own responsibility in any kind of publication or any kind of public information that comes out from the science discussion. From the policy side, ensuring that opportunities are provided to scientists to make sure that the input and participation in this discussion is, is possible is one of the most important bits probably to ensure that the future policy processes are more science oriented. This is actually, I have to say, the role that we have as IUCN and therefore actually the discussion that has happening now for us is fundamental. Thank you very much, Alberto. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next panellist here in the room, um, Anne Deval. Um, Anne, and I'm, I'm going to um, ask you um, about your role, um, because the UN has actually sent um, quite a clear signal with regards to tackling both climate and environmental crises, and actually underlying, underlining the key role of nature restoration in addressing these challenges. At the same time, the FAO has been doing a lot of work on mainstreaming biodiversity and trying to see the broader picture. And we're also very shortly going to see many of the key representatives going to Montreal for um, the uh, CBD post-2020 GBF uh, discussions. And we're only um, a couple of years away from the UN decade for ecosystem restoration. 
So I, I wondered if, if, in that context, if you could perhaps give your thoughts on the global priorities for nature restoration and how these potentially could be addressed through some collective actions. I think we've already heard from our two previous speakers how important that collaboration is going to be to, to achieve some of our key objectives. Um, so perhaps you could give us your perspectives on that. Thank you very much, Helen. And just on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup, I think it would be equally worth to hear perhaps on, uh, from a global perspective uh, on behalf of FAO uh, how important land and sea restoration is for uh, productive ecosystems providing uh, healthy food and uh, nutrition there. So up to one for, uh, for that. Okay, I'll try to, to combine both questions. <laughs> Starting maybe um, to give some idea at, at the global level when we're talking about land degradation, when you look at uh, the world's soil, then one third of it is moderately to highly degraded already. Moving on to uh, uh, the global fish stocks where one third again is overexploited. And I could go on and on as another uh, uh, panel member already said, there's, it's very urgent to take action and it's very clear that um, these kind of degradations directly have an effect on the yield of uh, farmers, have directly an effect on increasing um, food insecurity, and also affect or even threaten the income and uh, the livelihood of more than 2 billion people worldwide who are directly depending on agriculture sectors. So yes, this is a very important um, issue of uh, restoring the degraded ecosystems and especially also productive ecosystems because they, they are not only necessary for biodiversity um, uh, objectives, but equally for food and nutrition, for health and for our livelihoods, as we already said. That's also why the UN decade on ecosystem restoration was declared um, from 21 till 2030. Um, and the, uh, the main aim there is to prevent, to um, halt and to restore ecosystem uh, degradation in all continents and on all oceans as well. So that's a um, global movement where the um, co-lead has been um, taken up by FAO and UNEP, United Nations <coughs> sorry, Environmental Program. So there also you see the linkage between um, productive sectors and, and natural sectors. Um, so this is to, to situate the, the, how it is actually, or how the current situation is, um, but there are solutions that have been um, developed and um, in the different sectors that are related to uh, agriculture, uh, crop and livestock production, uh, fisheries, and um, to uh, forestry. I won't go into details into the, to the restoration options, but there are options, and of course they can further be developed and they have to be backed up by um, uh, evidence, uh, science-based evidence. Um, but it, there is a major effort to be made also when it comes to linking what is happen happening at field level to what is happening and the negotiations, negotiations sorry, that are happening at global level. So I'll just jump into the first question of, uh, of Helen. Um, because as, as we are preparing for uh, the conference of parties that will take place uh, on the, the, the Convention on Biological Diversity in uh, Montreal in December, so in a few weeks, um, there are a lot of hurdles still to be taken, um, as Gregoire said, at different levels. Um, but what we would like to put forward is that it will require a lot of um, political will and courage also and leadership to make sure that um, the different uh, sectors that are related to ecosystem restoration will be included into the targets that are supposed to be very clear and precise. So it doesn't only go about um, 
protection, but it's also about sustainable use of bio biodiversity resources. So that's why um, I think the next to all the different steps that are important, it will be also looking at the EU to take up this leadership and to mobilize the international community also to take action on reversing biodiversity de degradation worldwide. And as FAO, we are ready also to back up and to assist our members in uh, taking up this um, further action. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Anne. Um, so I, I'm going to move to, to, to Janneke uh, next to get um, her perspective. Um, Janneke, the European Environment Agency data um, has been a, a vital resource um, in creating many of the EU's biodiversity targets and has provided us with a, a biodiversity baseline. And I wondered if you could perhaps say a few words about how you envisage the data being used moving forward. Um, and I think one of the other supplementary questions that would be useful to, to, to have your thoughts on um, will be how the European a Environment Agency is able to support EU member states when they are creating their um, EU nature restoration plans. Of course. Um, so let's start with the, the question on data. Uh, it's right, the data that has been supplied to the agency by member states has played a large role uh, with integration of, of baselines and reference areas. And we will continue to work with member states to improve the data they send to us and we will use it to assess progress once it has been reported. We will also supplement this data with model data and this in turn will then be shared back to the member states. Uh, in addition to this, we will use Copernicus and Copernicus Drive products to assist in this task. And we have a variety of other data sets to use as well, for example, on protected areas, on land use and land use change and many more. And uh, these as well will assess, assess the progress and assist uh, the member states where needed. And it's important to know that all data is by principle freely available to member states. But we do not just provide the data, but we also interpret it and produce information and knowledge, which we use and, and, and share openly. Um, in terms of the support to the member states, uh, once the national restoration plans are being made, they are, of course, being made by the member states, uh, each of them for their own areas, but the EA will support here. So we can uh, bring expertise together, for example, through our IONET network, uh, and we can also guide in this process. And that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, on a more technical level, we are developing the reporting formats for these national restoration plans as well as information systems and data flows for the reporting. Uh, we will also have a help desk for the member states to support them through the process. And finally, uh, once the reporting comes in, we will assess the progress reports and we will monitor and report on the progress overall towards the target. Thank you ever so much, Annika. Um, I want to now come to um, uh, Irene Bonita Rodriguez. Um, so, um, Irene, I want to sort of um, have a few comments from you. Um, as you mentioned when you, in your introduction, you said you were from Planet. Um, Planet, obviously, um, its work is extremely relevant for today's discussion. Over the past decade, um, Planet has re revolutionized the Earth observation industry. Um, specifically, your work has democratized uh, data, um, which is a, a topic close to my heart, being an informatics specialist myself. But it's also um, allowed for key analysis by scientists, um, but also allowed um, timely and impartial decisions from policymakers through the availability of that data. So the, my question to you is actually that what do you perceive as the role of Earth observations? What, does it, what do they play in helping the EU achieve its um, biodiversity targets and in supporting um, the EU member states in implementing the mo and monitoring the, the nature restoration law? 
Um, where would you see the, the main challenges and opportunities ahead? Thank you, Helen. And well, firstly, as a citizen of Europe, I highly appreciate the work of the institutions to make um, hopefully the EU nature restoration law a reality. This is central and crucial as part of the EU biodiversity strategy and of course of the Green Deal. And for the first time, we're going to have binding uh, biodiversity targets and Earth observation is going to be crucial in order to monitor pro progress towards those targets. And um, for those of you that don't know what Earth observation really means, and Regine, if you can press again. So Earth observation satellites provide imagery on the surface of the Earth. This means that we are collecting information on all the changes that are happening on the globe. And this is information that comes from a visible uh, signals from the spectral, but also invisible. And Planet here is, um, has indeed revolutionized the, the sector. We have over 200 satellites orbiting the Earth every day. And if this is not the most amazing animation that you've ever seen in your life, then um, I don't know what to say. Um, we have um, a daily scan of the whole Earth. So this means that every single day, we're taking an image of every location on the globe. So you can detect and monitor change on a daily basis in a high level of detail. And of course, this is enormously useful. Um, first, it's providing, again, as I said, this daily information and daily change detection. But of course, also it provides a harmonized global data set and harmonized European source of data. And Regine, if we can go to the next one. I'm providing a couple of examples on um, on the uses of this kind of data for biodiversity. And actually, before I move here, I want to point out that we are so fantastic because we are providing the greatest amount of data and information um, publicly and commercially available. This means that we're providing more information than all public and commercial data sources combined every single day. So this is really groundbreaking what, what Planet has done. And in terms of a biodiversity monitoring, I think one of the clear applications comes from a uh, water management and the restoration of, of wash, water ecosystems. A very unfortunate but very clear event from this summer. You may be familiar with the Oda uh, River disaster. This is a river separating Poland and, and Germany, where over the summer thousands of fish uh, were founded. And the damage to the flora and the fauna has been estimated uh, by scientists that it will take several decades to actually recover. The causes were initially unknown. However, some scientists took um, planet data and did the first assessment of water quality um, indicators over time in the weeks leading to the disaster. And they found that one of the indicators is actually chlorophyll concentration. And that's what you can actually see in the, in the GIF changing. Um, the chlorophyll concentration was changing um, downstream and there more damage was identified. And actually this is now seen as the leading cause, chlorophyll being a proxy for, um, for algae blooms, for harmful algae blooms. And um, what was, I think, crucial here and how our data really played an enormous role was by the time actually the assessments were done, this was exposed. This was after the disaster took place. So you couldn't go and take a physical sample of the water because this water was already in the ocean. So with daily satellite imagery and this daily archive of imagery, you could go and assess in the weeks building up to the, um, to the disaster, what was going on in the water. And of course, it's also very useful when we're looking to monitor future uh, water bodies to make sure that we take action before it's too late, that we have an early warning. And if we go to the next example, um, the next slide, and twice, Regine, please. So another clear, Location is going to be in the management of forests. So we have this harmonized data set that is providing us daily tree level information of every forest in the world. And of course, of every forest in Europe. This means that we can monitor the health of forests. We can look at different degradation parameters. We can look at early signs of pests, of early signs of diseases, of early signs of drought. We can detect on a daily basis illegal activities to the individual tree level. So we can detect selective logging. We can detect a selective cutting. And we can look um, generally at broad uh, forest parameters and restoration. And this is something that Earth Observation really provides us today. So the big message is we have incredible tools at our disposal. We have very ambitious targets, which are fantastic, but deadlines are approaching. 2030 is approaching very fast. So let's make sure that we use the technology at our disposal to monitor progress towards these targets. Thank you.
Thank you ever so much, Irene. Um, I, I'm going to move on to our, our last panelist to, to get some perspective from, from uh, Felicia Akinyema to, to my left. Um, Felicia is, as I mentioned in my introduction, she's actually um, a, a member of the EGU's Biodiversity Task Force. Um, so, Felicia, I, I'm, my question is actually going to be more focused um, on your perspective of the, of the role of organisations like EGU um, in promoting these activities, um, both at the European level, but also at the member state level. So I, I just would like to ask you if you could say a few words about the aims of the EGU's Biodiversity Task Force um, and um, how it's been instrumental in providing feedback on the proposed nature restoration law. Um, as part of your answer, if you could perhaps give us some thoughts on um, the role that you think uh, an independent scientific organisation such as EGU um, plays in providing scientific advice to policymakers as well. Thank you so much, Helen. So, um, for the EGU um, task force, the Biodiversity Task Force, it's a scientific network of, um, of experts across Europe, and most importantly, we have the desire or the motivation to actually provide our thoughts, to share our expertise, especially at, uh, either at the EU level or even at the member state level because the nature um, restoration plans have to be provided, they have to be prepared, they have to be monitored, as well as the progress also monitored over time. So one um, issue would be that for the member states, it would be very, very uh, crucial for them to be able to assess in a timely manner localized um, scientific information, which can actually support the kinds of um, information or the types of indicators that the target of the EU biodiversity targets would require. And it's also important that we are able to assess um, scientific um, advice. So one major role that the, tax, the EGU tax force is well positioned to address and to support at both the EU and the member state level is to be able to help in terms of access, gaining access to the required expertise. We all would take into cognizance the, the fact that the issue of biodiversity is very diverse, whether in terms of um, the ecosystems, land-based, uh, marine-based, and also the approaches that will be used in the different member states. But on the other hand, it's also very important that we are able to get some uh, directives. So for example, in the recommendations that were made, seven key points were there, but one, I will talk briefly about two. One is the need to enhance the connection between ecosystems. One reason for this would be that these ecosystems, even though we restore them, actually are not um, in synergy with one another. So in this case, it's very important. I take the example of uh, peatland. More than 50% of peatlands in Europe are already uh, degraded or they are lost. But in this case, Restoring uh, peatlands gives us an opportunity to be able to generate better results in terms of the kinds of biodiversity that we are able to, to impact when, this, uh, when it, the peatlands are restored. On the other hand, it's also important to maintain the conservation status of those um, ecosystems, the habitats. So for most of the indicators or the targets, they actually are based on um, references to the past, 
but we also should have this long-term perspective to monitoring the different targets that we aim to achieve for, at the level of each member state. The reason also is that if we have this kind of perspective, then the long-term monitoring will be guaranteed. And in that sense, it's very easy for us to actually ensure that we get the full benefits that we'll need in terms of either monitoring, restoring, and maintaining the different um, ecosystems. So I think in summary, the EGU tax, Biodiversity Task Force would actually work more as a honest broker for scientific uh, knowledge. So we are able to support in the provision of scientific information, whether as a group or at the level of individuals, like I said, we are all diverse. We are um, present across Europe. We are also able to support the scrutiny of the scientific evidence and as well as we are able to help in highlighting the consequences of the different policy actions that policymakers might decide to take. So this, I think, is a way for the um, Biodiversity Task Force to be able to provide information that will be useful and understandable to policymakers. So we are very interested in the debates as well. Thank you. Thank you much, so much, Felicia. Um, I, think, I think our speakers have given us a, um, a number of different perspectives um, on, this, on this very important topic. Um, and, and I think um, we're, we're going to wrap up this policy, um, this discussion on this aspect um, with a more general question. So I, I'm going to hand the, the floor back to Ilias, who's, who's going to um, provide a single question just for all of our panellists, just to, to wrap up this part of, of, of this event. So Ilias, uh, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, for uh, moderating this uh, panel discussion. And I would like to take the opportunity to extend a warm thanks uh, to all panelists uh, joining us today uh, on site or online. Uh, I think that uh, all previous interventions have uh, greatly stimulated attendees' interest, uh, judging also by the number of questions received uh, via the platform that we will be uh, looking into in uh, a few minutes' time. Uh, just perhaps uh, before that, I would like to turn to panelists and ask you, well, as, we've coming, uh, as we're coming to the end of this discussion, perhaps just in one phrase, what is your key takeaway uh, of this uh, panel discussion so far? And then what would you like the audience to, to take home today? And we could follow equally the, the sequence uh, starting with Irene. Great. Thank you, Elias. And um, well, I just want to point out uh, once more that we are making incredible progress in the area of biodiversity and I think the EU nature restoration law is a perfect example. However, 2030, even 2050, they're approaching very fast and we need to move fast. We need to make sure that actors and decision makers have the necessary tools to be effective. And many of these are at our fingertips. The technology is there, especially when we're talking about earth observation, direct and services like uh, Janika just mentioned. So let's make sure that we don't miss the opportunity to empower decision makers with the right tools. Thank you. I think we, we, we get certainly uh, new tools, new methods, new interfaces between science and policy, new evidence. Everything is hopefully getting uh, easier to process and to handle. Are we going to take the right decisions in front of that? This is, I think, the, the, the main challenges and the question that remains open. What, what we miss completely is the link with the, with the actors on the ground. We have the evidence that we need to take actions. We have all these multilateral environmental agreements where, I mean, the COP27 is just aiding, ending. We start the COP15. I will be part of the EU delegation there. How can... I convinced the public that what we are going to do there makes sense. And I think we need to show that this science evidence is used for taking decisions and applicable on the ground and that something is happening. We need to gain the trust back from the public that this science that we use is driving us somewhere. So that's why I came with the first tag that we need not 
to drive somewhere because we can drive everywhere. We, we just need to steer this process all together in the direction that is uh, where we address equity, where we address conservation, where we address nature, where we address solidarity. All these things require much more than just a science policy interface. We need an additional interface is the direct contact with the public. So I think we need to, uh, that's something that, that, that I keep constantly in my mind and which is actually worrying me a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I think for us as uh, members of the EGU Biodiversity Task Force, one key message we would like to leave with everyone is the need to emphasize the science-based, uh, the use of science-based approaches. For example, the likelihood for the member states in achieving the biodiversity targets that are set would be ensured if, for example, supports in terms of expertise as well as the data can help in selecting, for example, ecosystems, habitats that are both uh, that are currently resilient as well as those that will be resilient in the future. It's also important, for example, not just to look at um, numbers in terms of the the progress in monitoring the indicators. It's possible, for example, to predict areas, whether in the future, which areas will unavoidably be impacted. That will be, we, there's nothing we can do. It will be, be transformed, whether it's climatic based or anthropogenic. So these are the kinds of questions that the tax force, whether directly or the bigger EGU family in terms of the um, different work, working groups can actually support the member states as well as the EU to do in terms of achieving the set targets. Thank you very much, Felix. And how about you, Anne, on behalf of uh, FAO? Um, I think there, there are several takeaways, but let me stick to this one, which I've been hearing um, being expressed by several people, and of course, within the mandate of FAO, um, that if we really, if we want to guarantee food security, nutrition and health for all, then it is really, we have to care about biodiversity and about ecosystem restoration. And we have to make sure that um, sustainable agri-food systems and other sectors, productive ecosystems are part of the solution. And there, there is a link to be made with what uh, Gregoire was saying, what is happening on the ground, what is already there, what are the experiences, what are the experiments, etc. And I know that from a lot of colleagues of FAO, they are doing a lot of the groundwork already in different sectors. So it's also a question of being able to share and getting the knowledge from up at the different levels where the decisions are being made. I think, thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. And perhaps now we can turn to online speakers. So how about you, Yannicka? Thank you. Um, I've heard a lot of good inputs today, and um, it's gonna gonna take a while to to melt this all down into a, into a great outcome. But what I want to highlight is that we have had voluntary commitments for for decades now um, in the previous biodiversity strategies. We have we have talked about this when the discussion was more focused on preserving nature and, and preserving biodiversity for its intrinsic value. Now the discussion has shifted uh, into preserving nature and ensuring restore, restoration of nature more than preservation, not just for the intrinsic value of biodiversity, which naturally is important, but also for our own future and our way forward uh, in, in the life we have on this planet. So, um, there have been some good advancements, and this this cannot go unmentioned because a lot of efforts have been made. Uh, but it's not enough. It hasn't been enough, and it's still not enough. So this new tool, nature restoration law, 
well, it should be seen as, as you know, restoring our livelihood law. And it should be seen as, as the tool to make sure that this will happen, that we will reach the goals now that they are written in a law. And, and just as the previous speaker highlighted, we need all sectors on board on this. Uh, I think it's even important and crucial to, to make sure um, that all sectors are on board, because if, if all sectors are not on board, on EU level, on global level, on member state level, uh, then restoration will not succeed the ultimate target that, that it set out. So I want to leave you with the thought that business as usual is no longer an option. We have to implement new tools and new ways forward, and, and this is the new way forward. Thank you very much, Janika, and I think that's a great uh, takeaway message. Uh, business as usual is no longer an option. And then on this note, I'll hand the floor to Alberto on behalf of IUCN for your key takeaways as well. Uh, Alberto, I know that uh, on behalf of IUCN, uh, there is uh, a lot of great work done, and within your uh, intervention as well, you were mentioning that we need action now. So what are you taking away of this discussion today? Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Elias. Well, we are focusing on the EU restoration law at the moment. And of course, science will be its guiding principle, both in the design and in the implementation. So actually, I agree very much with Gregor's message on awareness and the need for public valuation. We simply need to base our action on facts, current and desired. Now, with this in mind, I would like to highlight only three key words. First of all, historical opportunity. This is the first comprehensive law in Europe since the Habitats Directive in 1992. And by the way, it's also the first continent-wide law of this kind, restoration. This is simply once in a generation opportunity. Secondly, a stakeholders ownership. It has been mentioned many times, but to ensure that all key actors feel this law as their responsibility also is going to be the only way to ensure that implementation really works. And by the way, this includes also ensuring proper investment, which is very much related with political will, as we know. And finally, global leadership. This law, elaboration and implementation will be very difficult in the European Union. Yes, that is true, but it will be much more difficult such thing in other regions of the world where the capacity is even less. So our example is key. We are actually, I would say, being watched. And all this relates both the EU and the global dimension, as there are two crucial realities and processes happening now, the EU restoration law and the upcoming global biodiversity framework. So if you want for me to summarize one of the key points or the three key points here in relation with the EU restoration law process, which now in the, EU, the European Parliament is engaging, is about historical opportunity, stakeholder ownership and the global leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Uh, I think that was very much to the point, as I would like to take the opportunity to thank all panelists uh, for your key takeaways uh, during this panel discussion. Um, on this note, um, uh, I think it would be very interesting to also hear the reaction of MEP Ms. Uh, Rodriguez Ramos on behalf of the European Parliament. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez Ramos is uh, an MEP from Spain for the group of uh, Renew Europe uh, Inter Alia. Uh, she is uh, sitting in Envy Committee and she's also the shadow rapporteur for the Nature Restoration File. So a key MEP involved in this discussion today. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. First, uh, I would like uh, to apologize uh, to the delay. I was participating uh, in a debate uh, on COP27, and it was uh, not possible uh, for me to arrive early. Uh, second, I, let me thank uh, the organizers, the European Parliament Intergroup, on climate change, biodiversity, and sustainable development, and the European uh, Geosciences Union, as well as the host, uh, Cesar, uh, Luena, and Jutta, uh, to bring such an important topic uh, to the rooms uh, of the European Parliament, natural restoration, and the nexus uh, between uh, policy making and science. Um, over uh, half of global uh, GDP depends on na nature and the services uh, it provides. And uh, our health depends on uh, the biodiversity. Uh, the biodiversity gives us uh, air, water, productive soil, 
but uh, uh, however its condition has been deteriorating over the past uh, decades. Um, with a natural uh, restoration law, uh, I think we have an historical opportunity uh, we cannot afford to, to miss. Uh, I think the Commission's uh, proposal for uh, a, a natural restoration law is a good and solid uh, basis, but uh, I believe uh, there is room for improvement in uh, some as, uh, aspects uh, of the parliamentary process. The position paper um, um, I, I, I read of the European Geosciences Union uh, have uh, summit uh, will certain, certainly help us to achieve uh, the best uh, possible outcome. Uh, one of the core uh, elements of the regulation is the establishment of legally binding targets to restore uh, or de degrade ecosystems. Um, um, the national restoration plans uh, will cover the period up to 2050 with intermediate uh, deadlines for different targets and actions. I think uh, the monitoring of these targets is key for the success of this uh, proposal. Uh, in this regard, I, I, I believe uh, that the European Parliament can improve the proposal by improving uh, the evaluation of midterm objectives and by establishing clear monitoring indicators. Um, member states uh, must review their uh, national restoration plans every 10 years. Okay, I think it's uh, too long uh, of uh, a period to act. I think uh, we can discuss about uh, the mistem and the, this, uh, the, the, the review of the national plans. Um, I, um, I, I, I agree uh, with the, uh, we need to improve uh, uh, all aspects uh, of, uh, of public participation, especially concerning uh, the identify of areas to be restored in the national uh, restoration plans. Uh, in preparing their plans, uh, member states should, should take a particular account of the knowledge of local communities. As you explained on, in, in, the, in, the, in the paper, uh, people who live in near biodiversity areas uh, may have useful knowledge and uh, techniques uh, specific to the region they live in. They uh, normally they have the expertise to understand complex ec ecosystems and their voice should be heard in the elaboration of the plans. Another uh, point I found very, very, very interesting in your uh, proposal uh, to is uh, to include uh, soil biodiversity as an additional target in the nature restoration law. Uh, okay, it is essential for maintain healthy soils for agriculture practices and both urban and rural ecosystem services. Uh, we have been working on land use, uh, land use uh, uh, in different uh, files uh, this year in the MV committee. Um, I think uh, we uh, have to study uh, opportunity, the opportunity to include uh, uh, in this legislation an additional target. Um, uh, Another important theme, very, very, very important theme, is uh, the uh, 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 urban areas. Uh, uh, I would like to stress the importance of Article 6. According uh, to the World Bank, 75% of the population in the European Union live in urban areas. And with uh, this 
background, it is essential to apply nature-based uh, solution in urban systems, and we will work uh, to make it happen. Uh, last but not least, uh, we need to improve the funding of the proposal uh, to stop uh, the loss of biodiversity and the deterioration of our ecosystems. Okay, we need uh, not only decisive political action based on scientific evidence, but also we need the resources and a specific funding to carry it out. Without adequate resources, this law could remain a Maya declaration. Uh, finally, uh, I restoring uh, EU wetlands, uh, rivers, forests, uh, marine ecosystems, urban environments, and the species uh, they lost is uh, a crucial uh, cost-effective investment, the better investment in our future, in our food security, in our climate resilience, in our health, and in our well, uh, well-being. Uh, all in all, I look forward to exploring opportunities in the legislative uh, process of a nature restoration law. I, I am sure now is the moment to lead uh, by example, by actions, uh, hand in hand with uh, science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rodriguez Ramos. And indeed, the, there's a historical opportunity that we cannot afford to miss, as Ms. Uh, Rodriguez Ramos uh, very right pointed out. So thank you very much for your remarks, as we are counting on uh, MEP's leadership on this. And of course, the position paper on behalf of EGU that uh, Mr. Rodriguez Ramos referred to is also available in the hard copy at the entrance of the room for on-site participants. Looking at the events agenda and perhaps continuing with uh, plot twists, uh, we can try to screen uh, MEP Ms. Paulus uh, video message intervention uh, with the help of uh, technicians in the room. I guess it's like the Coldplay song, if we never try, we'll never know, so let's see. Dear Cesar, dear guests, dear colleagues, thank you for permitting me to host this great event exploring how we can support the EU's biodiversity targets by bridging the science policy divide. Unfortunately, I am not able to be present in Brussels today. As a scientist myself, I would have loved to be part of the panel, but of course the COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh is also a great opportunity to promote nature-based solutions. We will not solve the climate crisis without nature. And vice versa, the biodiversity crisis is acerbated by climate change. Deteriorating ecosystems are directly linked to the climate crisis. Without natural carbon sinks, no slowing down of the climate crisis. Our natural carbon sinks, the oceans, the forests, as well as the soils, are the world's largest carbon sinks and are hence fundamental for tackling climate change. Peatlands alone cover only 3% of Earth's land area, but they store that more than twice as much carbon as all forests combined. And they're not only important for climate change mitigation, but they're also vital for climate change adaptation by preventing flash floods, by cooling their surroundings, and by storing water for drier periods. Planetary boundaries such as climate change, biodiversity loss, freshwater pollution, land use change, and so forth, were defined in a groundbreaking story by the study by the world's leading scientists chaired by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And five out of nine of these boundaries have already been transgressed by the human civilization. We are moving outside the safe space for humans. The biodiversity loss on species level as well as on genetic diversity level is the most dramatic threat to our civilization. And this is not about the simple fact that the nature surrounding us looks a bit dry and unhealthy or that the abundance of butterflies and farmland birds I recall from my youth is long gone. This is about the web of life that provides us with fertile soils, pollinated crops, potable water and clean air to breathe. 
We hence need to listen to science and put biodiversity protection at the center of our political agenda. We need to make sure that the European Green Deal is not reduced to a European climate deal, pushing for more renewables and curbing greenhouse gas emissions alone, but that all promises of the Green Deal, ending pollution, healthier food systems, the transition to a circular economy, and bringing back nature are fulfilled. We are all aware, I guess, that nature conservation in Europe is no huge success story. Europe is the region where the most natural ecosystems have disappeared so far. New urban areas increase, ever more streets are cut through forests, and vulnerable and biodiversity-rich ecosystems such as peatlands and wetlands continue to disappear in the EU. This is not because of our regulatory basis for nature conservation would be poor, but rather because enforcement is lacking. 25 out of 27 member states still have not completed the Natura 2000 network. And according to the analysis of the European Environment Agency, only 23% of the species and a mere 16% of the habitats which are protected under the birds and habitats directives are in good conservation status. The nature restoration law is hence a key file in the European Green Deal, the first real nature legislation in 20 years. Therefore, I thoroughly welcome the Commission proposal as it puts biodiversity back to the center of the agenda. Of course, there's always room for improvement namely strengthening the indicators, increasing the overall restoration targets for peatlands, importantly. But we need to make sure that the nature restoration law is a regulatory tool that actually works. Because defining good indicators is not enough if we don't make sure that there is a dedicated funding mechanism and a functioning governance structure surrounding it. The Commission's impact assessment clearly shows that restoration is economically beneficial. Every euro invested in restoration generates at least eight euros in socio-economic benefits. However, we face many attacks by lobby organizations and so-called conservative parties who claim that food security and economic development are in danger, as if most of the food we grow were not dependent on pollination and as if natural resources were not the base of all economic development. A last remark, I do want to point out again that restoration often is mixed up with rewilding. While some ecosystems can be best restored through rewilding indeed, many of our most species-rich ecosystems are the result of human civilization. For example, nowhere in the world a meadow or cart would develop by itself. And just like this, there are many restoration measures which improve the condition of the ecosystem without excluding human utilization, be it for agriculture, for forestry, or for recreational purposes. In this regard, I wish you all fruitful discussions, and I'm looking forward to working on a very ambitious nature restoration law in the upcoming months. Thank you very much. I hope uh, the video was well received by participants online as we had some technical challenges in the room, but in any case it will be available on the EBCD website uh, as soon as possible, uh, so all uh, participants and speakers can have full access to the video message intervention of Ms. Paulus. Ms. Paulus, of course, is uh, a German MEP member of Environment Committee and Shadow Rapporteur for the Nature Restoration File. So on this note, I would like to once again apologize for that. And since we have uh, with us uh, MEP Mr. Luena, uh, co-host uh, of this event and uh, Rapporteur on behalf of the European Parliament, both for the EU Biodiversity Strategy, but also the Nature Restoration File, maybe we can give you the floor before we take some questions from the audience. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much to the EP Intergroup for inviting me to co-host this event with my colleague, uh, Gita. Thank you also to the speakers for your contributions to this uh, interesting discussion and to the rest of the participants for attending this uh, event. Thank you so much. I think this debate is key, especially in the preparation for the discussions that will take place at the COP15 COP15 in Montreal next month. Scientists have warned us for decades about the 
twin crises that are destroying our natural world, climate change, widely known, and the collapse of biodiversity, which requires urgent attention from global policymakers. Following scientists' advice to avoid the worst climate, climate outcomes, <clears throat> I think we have implemented a strategy to tackle this crisis, a European binding climate law, a target for net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, and discussions are ongoing in some sake to get a new global agreement to have everyone on board. Things are different when looking at the biodiversity crisis. We don't have any technological solution to restore species that go extinct. We don't have replacement for natural systems that are destroyed. Our ecosystems cannot wait any longer for us to take effective science-based decisions that will protect them from destruction. The Natural Restoration Law, for which I am the rapporteur and the, at the European Parliament, it's an ambitious step forward by the European Union to lead the world towards binding restoration targets. It's a pioneer proposal that will prevent the disappearance of ecosystems and the worst consequences of climate change. But this legislation will only be effective if we listen to science and we implement ambitious binding targets for all EU members, all. We need to protect pollinators, use close to nature practice in our forests, ensure the protections of the marine life and let our rivers flow freely. Our species, our ecosystems, our water bodies are essential to a healthy and climate relationship. And as reporter, I will work for an ambitious, ambitious science-based report that will restore our habitats and stop the drain of natural resources. However, this is not an European Union issue, but a global one that needs a worldwide solution, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, known as normally IPBES. Published in 2019, the Global Assessments Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, which alerted that a million, million species of plants and animals now face extinction, many within the next decades. The, the EU's role leading the fight against climate change and the biodiversity crisis ultimately two sides of the same coin, ultimately and always. I think we need an international commitment that should start in Montreal at the next COP15. I will be part of the EU delegation traveling to Canada and I will and I will defend the importance of making biodiversity a key priority for every government and every nation. Lastly, I would like to stress the importance of scientists' work and engagements in the policy making process. Your dedications dedication helps us better understand the scope of the crisis and the urgency of the solutions. Your contributions educate citizens around the world and raise awareness of the state of the nature that we all enjoy. Your proposals and also your recommendations are our guideline to implement effective policies. In conclusion, there is no way out of the climate and biodiversity crisis without science. Thank you uh, once again to all the participants for attending this event. I wish you a good rest of your Tuesday and thank you, thank you so much for your work and for your compromise and your dedication. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Glenn, on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup. Uh, it is indeed evident that the time to act is now. So thank you very much for your intervention, but also for your leadership in advancing uh, an ambitious science-based report for biodiversity and nature restoration. On this note, perhaps we can take some uh, questions uh, from the audience for speakers in the room, and then we can look into uh, questions already posed through the platform. So is there perhaps any burning question from audience here today? Yes, please. 
Hi, Noelle Baker, um, member of the EGU Science for Policy Working Group. Uh, thank you all for being here and for for putting effort and time into this. Uh, I would just like to point out the fact that many of the participants and uh, panel members yourselves are scientists. And uh, for those of us in the audience who uh, have put effort into this, we greatly appreciate that our comments have been received and considered in this event. Uh, my question to you is more and more scientists have been getting involved through a sense of urgency, because we see in our research how incredibly important and urgent it is to take action. I would just ask you, uh, what is your take on this? Uh, what can we do? And uh, what, what are the next steps? Thank you very much for this question. I guess it's an open one for all uh, speakers. So feel free to, to take the floor if you want to come in on this point. Yes, and thank you so much. And again, I am not a scientist myself, but I greatly appreciate the work of the scientific community. For us, I think in the area of Earth observation, science and research is essential because we are, we still don't know how much we can do with the data. Like the opportunities and possibilities seem gigantic. And we need the research community to take the first step and start looking and validating at the different use cases the different possible applications. So my job is to try to put the data in the hands of as many researchers as possible, because that's really the first step to then be able to inform better and, and, and more effective decision making. So I, I fully agree and I'm happy to like um, inform anyone in the room about how to access Earth observation and planet data for free. <laughs> Any other speaker perhaps that is interested in uh, taking this question as well? Grigoire, yes. Yeah, hi again, Noel. Uh, I had a similar session in, in EGU, uh, engaging with a lot of young scientists. And I allow myself to repeat a message of a scientific paper, which is usually the achievement of, of, of a scientist, really the first step. Once you have published your results, you have really to think about what is going to happen with the data? What's the information you provide? Is it going to be used and for what purpose? Shouldn't you be sitting behind and, and make sure that this information will be used really to change something on the ground? Because if you don't think further, we're not going to move anywhere. We will keep on being flooded by information, but not drive any kind of changes that are urgent now. We are just talking about our life support system, and it's not enough to do the research. We have a wealth of information. It's about driving the changes. The only way to drive these changes is to talk to the people, to the, to the citizens, to the colleagues, to the friends, to the family, constantly about what we can do together to, to, to move this in the right direction. Now, the right direction can be only given by many scientists, I'm really glad to have EGU on board because it's not only about biodiversity, biological process, it's about physical process, it's about geology changing, it's about the biosphere, it's about climate. So how can we have all this converging evidence that is integrated into a, a solid package that addresses the social challenges, equity, biodiversity, sustainable nature? Th these are the things that we need to drive together. And, there's still a long way to go. We need to have the interfaces to develop these interactions with the public. Go in your municipalities, talk to the, to, to the mayor, because this is the first element of democracy. This is where you can put something on the table saying we should change that and effectively see the change happening. So we can start there uh, at the fundamental levels of democracy and hopefully scale up these kind of movements at a, at a, at a larger scale. But we need to gain trust from the citizens that what we do in terms of science will be useful and will be going in the right direction. And as, at the moment, we, we, we are not good enough as scientists to communicate what are the consequences of the challenges that we have and what are the difficult decisions that we need to take together. And we, we are first citizens before being scientists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gregoire. Yes, Anne, you would like to step in? Maybe to add upon that, um, I'm not a scientist myself. I don't consider myself as a scientist, but I've been on the, the policy side. Um, I think the question is really how can science and the insights that come from science influence policymaking at different levels? 
And as you said, there are different levels to be taken into account. Um, but, but the importance is also, I think, on how to present what, what has been um, the, on the basis of which questions, which really policy questions are at the basis of those scientific research. And that connection sometimes has to be, has to be bridged and there has to be uh, um, more, more opportunities to, to meet and to make sure that what has been under research is actually uh, responding to the policy questions that are really the most urgent ones. And I know at, um, at European level there, there have been some, um, some efforts made, at least uh, for soil research, and I think that was a really step ahead <clears throat> excuse me, to, to, uh, to see as a, as a, a policy maker, okay, I can, I can count on those inputs from research to make sure that uh, what we present as next steps to, get, to take is really based on evidence. So look at to find those different um, opportunities to uh, to make those connections, and I think that is somehow also at what FAO is trying to do at at the global level then, um, and also at, at regional level to to link those insights and make them um, easily available and digestible for for policymakers so that they can in their turn take them to the next level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. And I also noticed through the platform that uh, Yannicka and Alberto are interested in uh, replying to this question. So I think, honestly, that's a great question there. Uh, okay. Maybe we can start with Yannicka. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I agree. It's a great, great question and really puts us on, on the spot on, on what needs to be done. Uh, continuing on this, um, on the science, uh, uh, providing the right science, the, re the researchers need to f also think about the output of their science so that it's it's the right questions, as Anne said, but so that it also caters to the policies that are being made, so that the data and the, the output of the data, the way it's presented, and is is usable, so that it, it can be um, interpreted for the policy questions that are being decided. That's my first point. Another very important point is we need to break down the silos. So um, uh, uh, last month I took part in a panel um, in Prague where I sat on the same panel with uh, somebody from the earth extraction uh, industry from the sector. And it was very interesting. We discussed the nature restoration law and it was very interesting to, to have this exchange with a sector who are uh, hands on doing work and, and need to think about the implications of this upcoming law. And I think this is something we need to see more, more of. So we need to see uh, the silos breaking down. We need to see scientists and policymakers speaking to people from all sectors. And uh, for some reason, this seems to be rather challenging, uh, but this is uh, something we have to do now because as already pointed out, we have to have all sectors on board to make this happen. And I think there's a lot of sectors out there who don't even realize that they can be champions. They can be the ones to implement the needed changes. And if they see uh, this not as a cost, but actually as an investment, an investment in, in that their work can go on in the, in, in the new format that's required, then I think uh, it's a good way for them to, to come on board and for this whole package to work. Because it's not only the scientists who can solve this, the scientists are very important and they are providing us with absolutely valuable information. And, and here at the EA, we, uh, we, we work with this information a lot. But for the final output, we need to look at the broader scope. Um, so that's my second point, breaking down the silos. Thank you very much, Yannicka, for this. And Alberto, perhaps any reflections on this question as well? Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. Well, most have been said, but it's also good to realize if you want the scientific community responsibility. It has been mentioned a number of times, but it's good to emphasize it. And let me start saying the same again. I am not a scientist myself also, but I work with scientists, I think, since the start of my career. It's uh, fundamental, the role of scientists, and it's actually the ones that are, those are the ones that are really making us realize that there needs to be a change. 
Now, when we prepare some paper, there are some organizations that say that uh, when you prepare a paper in the policy domain, let's say you should dedicate a percentage of time to prepare an, and another strong percentage of time to disseminate it or to see what you are going to do with it exactly. Some people say that it's only 10% in the development and 90% in the work just to use it outside. I don't know what is the exact percentage, but definitely it will be much more probably from the scientific side in terms of thinking what to do with it. Because at the very end, as Gregor was saying, sometimes you can have an incredibly good and positive and useful message that maybe will just get lost because nobody will use it. There is even another possibility that somebody else will use it instead of you and go in the direction that they want to go. So simply it's important to realize that the responsibility of producing new information is not stopping in the moment that it's produced, but rather in the moment that it's used. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto, for your reply, and also to all speakers, of course, for your uh, kind flexibility, as we have, we have extended the official timing uh, for this event today. And I notice in the room that there is a lot of movement. I understand that there is uh, an upcoming meeting taking place very soon. Uh, so on this note, I would like to thank you all once again. And uh, for the economy of the discussion, I'll just be providing the floor back to Helen for some uh, key takeaways and uh, some closing remarks also from your side on behalf of uh, EGU, uh, co-organizers uh, of this uh, event today in the European Parliament. Thank you very much, Elliot. Um, in the interest of time, I, I will keep my remarks quite short, but I, I do want to make a few key observations from today's discussion. Um, I, I first, I, I want to add my thanks to the panellists for what I think has been an interesting and informed discussion on a, on a critical and timely topic. Um, but I want to come back to the point that Alberto made in his intervention, because I think this is a critical message for all of us and is certainly one of my takeaways from today. And that is that action is needed now. And that's because we're all scientists or we're involved in policy making. Uh, everyone in the room has a different role. But the one common factor that we all have is that we see a change in our environment. We recognize that our environment is, is not the same as it was in the many, for the many decades before. And that we need to act to restore our environment. But also, as Felicia observed in her intervention, there is another key aspect here, which is that we also need to halt the ongoing degradation at the same time. So we know not only need to be thinking about restoration, thinking about halting the ongoing degradation and maintaining those environments and not allowing a further erosion. But an important aspect of acting now that I've heard from a number of our panelists today is the importance of communication as part of this activity. We need to ensure that we are not only communicating bilaterally between scientists and policymakers, but we need to be having an interaction across sectors, but also we need to be interacting with society. We need to make it clear why these actions are important, why they're needed now, and why we are seeking to actually really take action to address these challenges. I think the other important point was made by Irene in her intervention, where she mentioned the importance of the availability of data and availability of data to everybody. Democratization of data is critical for um, scientists to do their research, but also to deliver trustworthy and sound research to policymakers. So I think these are all important facets of the discussion we've had today. And I think this event has been an opportunity to bring together scientific experts and policymakers to address the priority areas. And I think the, the key thing that I've taken away from today's discussion is the critical value of those interactions and they highlight the need for a consistent and ongoing dialogue between scientists and policymakers, but also with other stakeholders. We should make sure that we are not focused on this bilateral interaction. But I think the one key message that I will take away, Ilias asked what the key message was for each of the panelists. The key message that I think I will take away today is the comment that was made that there is no way out of the climate and biodiversity crisis without science. 
Um, I may get a T-shirt made with that put on the front, actually, because I think that is a really critical message for everyone who's engaged in addressing these issues. So I want to wrap up this discussion with a few thank yous. Firstly, I would like very much to thank you, thank our hosts, um, MEPs Luena and Paulus for facilitating this discussion and hosting this event today. I'd also like to, to thank Ilias and his colleagues um, at the Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development, who've um, co-hosted this event today. Um, I have to say I personally have found this a really um, positive experience in organising this event. So, Ilias, I'd like to thank you and the rest of the Intergroup for your, your time and um, efforts in organising this event. Lastly, I would also like to thank Ms. Rodriguez Ramos because I, I felt that her um, support and comments on the recommendations that have been made by the EGU's Biodiversity Task Force are really important and valuable for those who've been involved in our task force in addressing this issue. Um, so if, they, if our thanks could also be conveyed to Ms. Rodriguez Ramos, that would, we would appreciate that. Um, for those of you who are in the room, we, continue, we can continue um, our discussion over, over coffee. Um, I apologise to those of you who are online who are not able to join us. Um, but we um, will wrap up this event by thanking everyone, our hosts, our contributors, and particularly our panellists, both here in Brussels and online. I think this has been an excellent discussion. Um, but I want to echo something as my final remark um, that was said by one of the panellists, and I've forgotten who it was, so I apologise. We need to have a consistent and ongoing dialogue. So I hope today's event is the start of a conversation, and I would encourage you all to think about this event as being the start of a conversation. So thank you all for your participation and your time today. <laughs>